Good day, everyone. I'm Dennis Jokis, uh, CTO with Canada Health Infoway and head of the Emerging Technology Group. I want to welcome you to this uh, webinar uh, in our series of topics uh, dealing with emerging technology solutions to advance the digital health agenda in Canada. Uh, just a few uh, housekeeping items. Uh, we will be recording this session and we'll be posting it on our website for your future use and reference. And as the moderator indicated, we certainly do want to welcome your questions. Uh, we probably will have about 20 minutes to take those, so please uh, post them as she indicated. And uh, we will take those at the end of uh, the presentation. And just some more housekeeping around disclaimers. Uh, this webinar represents the sole views of InfoWay. It is designed to be informative and shouldn't uh, be necessarily representative of any current or future strategies or investment criteria we might have. And uh, we might mention some vendors in the context of this presentation, and we're not uh, implicitly or explicitly endorsing any particular vendor or technology solution. Uh, this is our fifth white paper in the Emerging Technology Series. Uh, the prior four were around big data, uh, cloud computing and health, and two on mobile, one that dealt with uh, the use of mobile with clinician-clinician interactions, and a second that dealt with mobile technologies with respect to clinician-patient interactions. Our white papers take uh, the form of outlining the applicability of this technology, uh, various use cases, the benefits of it in the context of Canadian healthcare delivery, some of the challenges one might uh, encounter and how to deal with those, various approaches to how to deploy this technology, and a call to action for the Canadian healthcare system. Our objective in publishing these is to help guide uh, the Canadian health sector in applying new, often emerging, and often disruptive technologies to the digital health agenda. I'd like to introduce uh, Stanley Radicek, a group director with InfoA, who took the lead on this paper uh, with assistance from Mark Nadanovic and myself in, in writing it and reviewing it. Stanley, I'd like to turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Dennis. Um, today uh, in our webinar, what we'd like to do is follow the basic outlines of our paper. And we'll begin with setting the context for uh, federated identity management in Canada. Uh, we'll touch on some examples that we found and uh, as with all of our uh, emerging technology papers, uh, we'll have a brief discussion on some of the key privacy and security considerations. Uh, and we'll, we'll close the session with um, a call to action to stimulate discussion uh, on the topic of federated identity management. Um, many of you have seen this slide from InfoWay before, and, and you know, really this is all about uh, providing better care to patients. And in order for us to do that, we need to provide um, uh, solutions that can be easily used by clinicians. And uh, what we're trying to do is accelerate interoperability. And by accelerating interoperability of clinical solutions, uh, it's all about um, access to content with minimal disruption to workflow. And what we're going to try and do today is demonstrate how federated identity management can minimize the disruption to workflow. As we were preparing the paper, we, we recognized that uh, we had quite a few challenges with regards to definitions in the space of federated identity management. And so the beginning of our paper uh, presents a few definitions that we'd like to uh, summarize for you today. Uh, the first being digital identities. Uh, many people have different definitions of what a digital identity is, but essentially it's a representation of a person's identity information that is used to support uh, the accuracy of future identity claims. So uh, a perfect example would be my digital identity associated with my professional context is very different than the digital identity associated with my online gaming context. Very, very different. Um, then there's the uh, terminology associated with digital credentials. Uh, we're all familiar with credentials such as our provincial driver's licenses. These are credentials that are used um, as uh, evidence to uh, an authentication process, and the same goes with digital identities. They're basically used uh, to authenticate individuals. Uh, they're presented in that context. They could be user ID and passwords. Uh, they could be um, digital certificates, and they could also be 
NFC cards or near field communication enabled smart cards, such as the ones we see um, in our credit cards and banking cards. Uh, another terminology is the identity and credential issuers. So who are they? These are the trusted organizations that are members of a federation that basically issue uh, digital identities and credentials. They could be public sector organizations, uh, such as provincial governments. They could be health delivery organizations. They could even be the private sector, such as financial institutions. And uh, they're the ones that are basically creating uh, the identities and credentials we'll be referring to throughout the presentation. The other uh, members of a federation are the folks that we call relying parties. Now, these are members of the federation that rely on the digital identities and credentials that were issued by the issuing organizations. Uh, so uh, they essentially um, do not have to have um, an identity management solution in place. They're relying on identities that were issued by other organizations. Uh, and hopefully they're trusting those identities and credentials that have been issued by um, the trusted third parties. They no longer have to worry about the storage or secure storage of passwords and uh, the, uh, the management of user uh, credentials and passwords because the, that's being done for them uh, on behalf of being done for them by the, um, the issuers. The next term is uh, Identity Management uh, Federation and that really is the group of organizations that agree on the common set of processes and uh, the trust models that are necessary to leverage identities and credentials issued by third parties. Uh, all of this needs to be um, defined. And uh, what we've discovered in our paper is that, uh, you know, federated identity management is not necessarily a technological problem. The standards have been out there um, and, and have been used for many, many years. It's more of a governance issue. And so a lot of our paper focuses on the governance aspect. <clears throat> One of the other challenges that we faced was, so what's the difference between single sign-on and federated identity management? And what we're going to try and do is in the next two slides demystify that for you. And there is, there is a subtle difference. Now, uh, federated identity management to be of value requires some type of single sign-on functionality. And this is typically done through uh, interoperable standards-based authentication and authorization protocols, such as the one mentioned on this slide, SAML version 2. What this allows us to do is to have one digital identity, and in this case a password, uh, per individual that is accepted throughout the members of the Federation. So it addresses the problem of repetitive logons, and it helps to establish trust between uh, the members of the Federation. Now, uh, members of the Federation, the relying parties, can, if they so choose, perform authentication and authorization based on uh, these uh, digital identities and credentials and the concept is rather similar to uh, a Canadian passport in that sense. However, single sign-on technologies do not necessarily require federated identity management. So what this slide attempts to do is to, to provide you with an insight as to what single sign-on technologies do for us, and they do have a place uh, in today's healthcare system. Uh, the single sign-on technologies, typically what they do is they have multiple digital identities and passwords that are stored uh, on behalf of the end user and they script logons uh, on behalf of the end user. So in this particular case, we, we may have applications in Emerge, a GP office, and e, an e-referral application, all offered by uh, different solutions. And each one of these solutions probably has their own siloed identity management scheme, which requires uh, identity password, uh, identity ID one through two and three, and then re the respective passwords. And in this particular situation, a clinician is logging on to either Emerge, their GP office, or their e-referral application. They're logging on to their phone, and they're using one digital identity and password. But what the single sign-on technology does behind the scenes is it maps that one password to the other passwords and user IDs that are necessary for each one of these other applications. So yes, single sign-on technologies do solve the, the irritants of having to log on many times and having to remember which user ID and password to use. They do all of that uh, on behalf of the individual. However, they are to do that, they're required to store user ID and passwords in some type of a database or file, which then requires the encryption uh, of those passwords to securely store them, uh, which then infers that you now have to worry about key management of uh, the encryption keys. Uh, it means that you have to worry about uh, the fact that memory is secure, therefore erased every time 
um, a logon is created, uh, but it still requires uh, the end user to manage the multiple passwords and user IDs that they have. Those have not disappeared. So again, single sign-on technologies do have a place, and that's typically within the confines of one organization. Um, and they have, uh, again, they don't solve all of the federated identity management issues. The next couple of slides um, are intended to demonstrate the value that federated identity management brings to the healthcare system. So we have to understand the following terminology, the concepts of context, entities, identities, roles, and applications. In this particular um, user uh, use case, we have Dr. Lambert who wishes to access applications in an EMR application, an HR finance, and a hospital information uh, system application. And he's operating in a, context, a professional context and he has relationships with uh, several entities, and these are the community care clinic, the acute care, uh, acute care facilities. And each one of those applications to the right, uh, in this particular instance, has their own identity management solution. Therefore, um, identities and credentials are issued to Dr. Lambert in, in order for him to access any one of these applications. So Dr. Lambert finds himself in a situation where um, he has relationships with two entities, and he has three user IDs and passwords, and he has to remember which one to use uh, whenever he act, tries to access any one of the three applications. Um, studies have shown that the average healthcare facility has close to 12 uh, applications, so in a worst case scenario, uh, <laughs> Dr. Lambert would have 12 user IDs and passwords to remember. So this, uh, this problem becomes very, very complex quickly. Now, what happens if we have a federated identity management solution in place? How does this affect Dr. Lambert's day-to-day uh, -day, uh, professional duties? Well, he's still operating in a professional context. He still has his relationships with uh, the two entities, the community care clinic and the acute care facility. However, in this particular instance, he has one professional user ID and credential. So one digital identity, one credential, that could, have be, uh, that could have been issued by either one of the two entities or it could have been issued by a trusted third party. In any event, Dr. Lambert still uh, wishes to access the three applications and if those three applications are members of the Federated Identity Management Solution, uh, he can use that one uh, digital identity and credential to access all three systems. So very, very powerful. Um, it helps to solve a lot of irritants for Dr. Lambert. However, federated identity management is not just for clinicians. It applies to consumers as well. We're all familiar with you know, the, the multitude of user IDs and passwords that we need uh, about, as we go about our personal lives and, and try to access various sites. Uh, this is no different for Henry Lambert. Now he's in his uh, context with his, his personal context, and he wishes to access a consumer health solution and a personal uh, health record on behalf of an elderly parent. He's, he's been defined as a substitute decision maker and he's, uh, he's looking over their needs. So if he wishes to access a consumer health solution as a client to schedule e-visits and e-booking um, and then to uh, manage the outcomes of some remote patient monitoring devices, uh, he would then be able to use his one digital ID and one credential to access both applications. If um, he's, uh, he's part of a federated identity management scheme. So what is really the, the, what is the true challenge when we talk about identity management? Well, what we're trying to do is provide convenient access to digital health solutions and personal health information. And we recognize that uh, we're seeing an expanding portfolio of new digital health solutions uh, coming to the marketplace, e-referrals, uh, e-booking, e-visits, et cetera. And from a consumer as well as a clinician perspective, we're starting to see many irritants with regards to these multiple identities, credentials, and then having to log on repeatedly. And we feel that digital identity should not be a barrier to productivity for both consumers and clinicians. We also recognize that healthcare is a very complex environment, that from a clinician perspective, they're accessing um, digital health solutions from many locations. They have many employee relationships and contexts working with different facilities. And if each one of these facilities requires them to have a unique set of digital identities and credentials, um, 
it becomes very problematic, not to mention the what, what I'll call the multiple enrollment fatigue of having to enroll uh, and prove your identity every single time you have a new uh, digital identity and credential. The other dimension to the identity management challenge is the one of capacity and cost. Now, if each one of these solutions that we're referring to, the, you know, this expanding portfolio of digital health solutions, uh, has their own siloed identity management solution, uh, from an organizational perspective, it increases the information system costs, the human resource costs, having to redo this identity proofing multiple times, having to uh, reset and manage passwords multiple times. And this becomes a, a, a barrier in, in reducing our ability to onboard new users into our new digital health solutions. So when you're thinking about onboarding thousands of, of consumers into your new EHR portal, um, it becomes problematic having to go through all of these um, identity management tasks over and over again. In our paper, we asked ourselves the question, so who in Canada is doing federated identity management today? Are there, are there any initiatives uh, out there? And, and we were pleased to see that we've, we have at least three, and this is not an exhaustive list, there may be more, but we've seen three uh, federated identity management solutions. The first one that we'd like to talk about is the BC Services Card. Now, this is essentially a reissuance of the driver's licenses and healthcare cards in uh, the province of BC, and they'll be reissuing those cards um, using smart card technology, so it's the same type of technology you'll see in your banking cards. And uh, in this model, it's a trusted government credential, and they intend to be able to use this online as well. So it's also a digital identity, and it will also be a, a, a digital credential. And um, you can combine these, so that you can either get a separate driver's license and health card, or you can have a BC services card that is combined and have both cards uh, on one, uh, both virtual cards on one physical card. And the intent here is to offer more online government services, and they'll be able to do that because there are enhanced um, authentication techniques associated with this card. So in this particular model, we have a, a, a government, a public sector entity that's issuing cards that can be reused by many relying parties. And an, uh, an important part of that is the fact that these, uh, these credentials will be privacy enhanced as well as the identities. We'll talk more about that later. Another interesting uh, initiative is from the Government of Canada. Uh, and this is the Cyber Authentication Renewal Initiative. And uh, the Government of Canada uh, recognizes that uh, federated identity management will be that strategic enabler for providing online gov government services. Now, where this model differs from the BC Services Card model is uh, the Government of Canada recognizes that they do not issue digital identities and credentials. That's, I mean, in the case of BC, it's usually the provincial governments that issue uh, the, the, the pieces of uh, ID, the credentials, such as driver's licenses, and they recognize that. So what they're going to do is they're going to leverage um, digital credentials and identities that have been issued by other jurisdictions, such as uh, the provincial and territorial governments, but also from the private sector, from the financial industry sector. And uh, the use of these credentials will be privacy enhanced, and uh, again, we'll talk more about that in a moment, but uh, the other thing that they're doing, which is of tremendous value to, to the healthcare system, is they are working with all the jurisdictions, provinces and territories, and they're facilitating the development of a trusted federal, a federated digital identity ecosystem. So what do we mean by that? Well, they're actually working on developing all of the standards, processes, and frameworks that are necessary to establish trust within, uh, within Canada. And these standards, uh, frameworks, can potentially be leveraged by the healthcare sector. So uh, this is an interesting um, initiative to follow. The next um, initiative that we found is something called Ontario One ID, and um, to our knowledge, this is really a Canadian first. This is a this is a Canadian first in the sense that we have a federated identity management solution that's being developed specifically for the healthcare sector, and what they're doing is they're issuing trusted digital identities and credentials to healthcare providers that will enable them to access provincial information assets and digital health solutions, things like secure email, et cetera. And what they've also done is by establishing a trust framework and various levels of assurance with regards to digital identities and credentials, uh, they're going to be leveraging the ability of healthcare delivery organizations to perform things that they do well, such as identity proofing of 
the clinicians that work in their organization. Eventually, uh, they'll be rolling this solution out um, in a context of where they'll be accepting the digital identities and credentials from other organizations, other healthcare delivery organizations, in addition to the one ID credential. So let's look at the value proposition of federated identity management. And really what we're seeking to do is to provide this trustworthy, seamless access. So we recognize that um, what federated identity management will allow us to do is it will allow consumers to access multiple portals with one digital identity. It'll be a tremendous help if someone's trying to access a provincial asset such as a lab, uh, lab repository to not have one ID for that and one credential and then another when they want to do e-booking with their EMR, uh, sorry, yeah, with their clinician through the EMR solution and then do something else for, for a virtual visit. And so uh, one credential, one identity will be very useful to consumers. Uh, the other aspect will be the sharing of personal health information across organizational boundaries. We feel that will be the norm. The only way to, to do e-booking is most likely to, to access uh, the calendars across different organizations. So that will become the norm, and we're really going to need some type of federated identity management solution to do that in a seamless fashion. Um, we, uh, the other interesting thing that we found with uh, federated identity management schemes is that many jurisdictions have a legislative obligation to, uh, to inform individuals um, with regards to who has access to their personal health information. So if a healthcare provider, if a clinician has three, four, ten different digital identities and credentials and logs on with those ten different identities and credentials and does so from various locations, thereby multiplying that problem, how would you respond to the request of, I'd like to know who's accessed my electronic health record? How would you be able to do investigations should there be a potential privacy or security breach? How would you do auditing? If uh, you, uh, you find it very difficult to tie back all of these identities to one clinician. Having one consistent federated identity management um, credential and identity will help you address this problem space. And the other one is if you're a relying party, then you don't have the risks associated with the password storage and management that we discussed earlier. Another component um, of the value proposition are, is, is really cost reduction and faster integration. So um, if we can reduce the consumer irritant of these, the face-to-face -face identity proofing multiple times, uh, the management of the credentials and the passwords multiple times, uh, that would allow us to integrate consumers into the new digital health solutions uh, at a faster rate. Uh, if you've outsourced the entire um, federated identity management solution, if you're a relying party, in other words, uh, you can reallocate the monies that you would have spent for your siloed identity management solutions. You can take that capital expense and you can reinvest it in something that's far more productive, such as new digital health solutions. The fact that you can rely on credentials that were issued by other organizations allows you to do faster onboarding of consumers when they want to access new digital health solutions. And the fact that you can reduce all of your uh, um, administrative and operational costs because you don't have the, this, these uh, siloed uh, identity management solutions deployed throughout your organization. So as in all of our papers, uh, we take some time to discuss what some of the key privacy and security considerations are for any emerging technology. And in our federated identity management paper, uh, we, we do that as well. And the first um, series of considerations have to do with governance. So if trust is the foundation of federated identity management, that means that all members of the federation need to agree on, on that common set of standards, policies, and procedures. So how do we do identity proofing? What's the minimum standard? Do I need two pieces of photo ID or something else? Um, these have to be set. Uh, so there's uh, more detailed discussion on, on what, what's required in that space. The next is for us to, to define what the common standards and policies and procedures would be, we need to have some type of a governance structure in place. So those that are contemplating uh, deploying federated identity management need to think about um, who will be part of this governance structure. And what we are advocating in the paper is that in many cases uh, we can leverage existing governance structures that are already in place within either healthcare organizations or regional health authorities or even provincially. So um, the governance structure need not necessarily be something that is huge and at a provincial level. 
if you're implementing federated identity management within your, your local facility to minimize the 12 user IDs and passwords uh, for the average healthcare facility, then you can involve a limited number of stakeholders to define what the governance structure would be for your organization, for your healthcare delivery organization. You can then expand that out uh, regionally and then provincially. The other um, issue that we, um, that we raised in the paper is legislative authority. Um, in some cases, uh, jurisdictions have found, provinces have found that they need to modify legislation in order to allow them to have the authority not only to collect the personal information to be used to issue uh, identities and credentials, but then to be able to use those. So that's something that organizations need to think about. Do you have the legislative authority to do this? The next series of considerations have to do with uh, what we call trust and security models. So Info is a firm believer in the concept of adopting existing tr uh, trust and security models, such as the work that's being done by the Government of Canada, and uh, if necessary, adapt those and uh, as a last resort, develop any if, if those don't meet your needs. So what are security and trust models? They're essentially the minimum guidelines that you need for something like the authentication assurance. So um, is a four-character password appropriate? Will that be accepted by all members of the association or do we want some biometrics as a level of authentication and a level of assurance? Um, we need to define what a formal trust model is from a federated identity management perspective. Uh, we need to think about the criteria for identity proofing. So uh, if a face-to-face -face identity proofing is required, two pieces of photo ID, uh, does that work for members of the federation? Or do uh, something like a, a, uh, a self-asserted identity that is socially validated, is that acceptable as a credential? So what I'm referring to specifically are the IDs that we currently use in LinkedIn. So I assert my identity in LinkedIn, but that identity is socially validated by my peers uh, professionally, and uh, so, so is that credential sufficient to provide access to uh, digital health solutions and uh, personal health information? The other thing we talk about in the deployment consideration section is the retrofit of digital health solutions. So if today many digital health solutions have their own identity management and authentication component, if we were to externalize that to a third party or to uh, a credential issuer, uh, then we probably need to think about modifying the digital health solutions that we have in place to support uh, the new authentication techniques and identity management techniques. And last but not least from a uh, deployment considerations perspective um, is the, the, the issue of privacy. And so what we advocate in the paper is that any federated identity management framework must include the definition of privacy requirements. Do you, how do you and how will you notify individuals uh, of the information you've collected, the personal information uh, you've collected on their behalf to issue credentials? Do you uh, wish to uh, have the authority to link different identities together to form one identity? And then obviously there's the performance of privacy impact assessments to determine uh, what your privacy risks are and what the mitigating strategies would be. The other thing you probably need to give some thought to is, is do you wish to have clinician and consumer control over their personal health information. What we mean by that is if you're collecting personal information uh, on behalf of clinicians and consumers to issue them digital identities and credentials, uh, do you want them to have the ability to revoke their consent for future disclosures of personal information? What would that solution look like? So we need to give some thought to that. Um, and last but not least is really including privacy by design into your federated identity management solution. And as we mentioned earlier, my identity is socially constructed and it's very contextual. My, as I said, my online gaming identity is not my professional identity. So what we want to do is we want to be able to ensure that we increase the level of difficulty necessary to track uh, the use of my digital identity within a given context. And one of the techniques that have been used uh, by many solutions has been uh, what we call the persistent anonymous identifiers and triple blind. And in the next slide, uh, we'll try to summarize what triple blind does for us. So in this particular um, example, we have an individual um, that doesn't quite look like me, but uh, there's an individual here. Let's, for argument's sake, this individual's name is Stan Radichak. And, uh, I'm, uh, I'm trying to access an e-referral application and a mental health application and then a personal health record. Uh, and uh, these three applications are relying parties in our model. 
So if I'm using a credential that's been issued by a financial institution, digital identity credential issued by a financial institution, if that credential had my name on it, and I shared that with a trusted third party and then logged on to any of the applications you see on the right, any individual will be able to say, oh, okay, Stan's got a mental health problem and he's been referred by a specialist and uh, he's logging all of his, uh, um, he, you know, how he feels today in his personal health record. Now, the way we can ensure privacy is, let's say on the, on the left-hand side here, the um, credential issuer does not provide my name uh, to a trusted third party. What they provide is this persistent anonymous identifier. So, so I'm known now as Q4513, and Q4513 is the only information that this trusted third party that performs the triple blind does. So they have no personal information stored in the triple blind service. All they know is that you know there's an individual called Q4513. And what they do is they map uh, Q4513 to uh, another series of meaningless but unique numbers, M buns. And it's these unique M buns that are the numbers and identifiers that are shared with each one of these three applications. So the, the issuer, in this case a financial institution, has no way of knowing that I've accessed an e-referral application or a mental health solution, nor does the trusted third party performing the triple blind functionality. And uh, the folks in the mental health application have no clue that I've accessed an e-referral or a PHR application. So in summary, that's what triple blind does for us. And uh, there are several vendors in the Canadian marketplace that have actually implemented this in several solutions, and it's used by um, uh, I would, we know for a fact it's used by the BC government in the way that they use their uh, digital identities and credentials. So the next series of questions that we try to address in the paper, so if federated identity management is so important and can be so beneficial to the healthcare sector, when should we consider using it? And, and the first category uh, that, that you should consider is the need for cross-organizational access. So if consumers are going to access portals across several organizations, and the same thing goes for clinicians, uh, and if you feel that you need to, 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 uh, to access or accept externally issued certificates um, to meet your uh, custodial obligations as a data custodian, then maybe that's the time to start thinking about federated identity management. Another category is if you have uh, barriers to adoption, whether it's from a consumer perspective, if they're accessing more than three uh, digital health solutions, um, maybe it's time to start thinking about federated identity management. The same goes for clinicians, and that could be within an organization or externally across organizations. Uh, if you want to eliminate the, this problem of repetitive logons and different credentials, uh, that's when it's time to start thinking about federated identity management. So um, in our call to action uh, section, we, we, we provide uh, some guidance with regards to um, where we think this is, the discussion needs to go in the Canadian healthcare space. And the, and the first uh, element is really uh, determine when you need feder to, to implement federated identity management. So the number one is tied to number seven to some degree, but we need to figure out, so, so where's the business case and, and when do I want to implement federated identity management? Once you've done that, once you've determined that you need to implement uh, some type of federated identity management solution, um, what, what governance structures do you wish to leverage within your context to help you achieve your goals? And uh, in the healthcare sector, there's, there's, we feel that there's no point in reinventing the wheel. If there's a lot of work being done by the you know, provincial governments and the federal government and, and other entities, uh, we need to establish some mechanisms, mechanisms where we can collaborate as an industry uh, to leverage all of these learnings. So whether it's uh, uh, leveraging the, the common frameworks and policies that were developed by other organizations, uh, such as the uh, Government of Canada, uh, less, uh, leveraging the lessons learned uh, from uh, their deployments, all of these uh, need to be shared in our industry and we need to find mechanisms for, for that collaboration. The other um, interesting call to action here is the consideration of leveraging uh, trusted private sector solutions. So there are solutions out there uh, that are, in some cases, uh, private sector solutions that are cloud-based that allow you to, to essentially outsource identity management and authentication to a trusted third party, leveraging uh, credentials that were issued by financial institutions uh, and used by governments. Uh, these are solutions that are out there, and this would greatly reduce your operational and your expenditure costs 
uh, if you can pay a dollar or so per transaction for the issuance of certificates and validation of credentials. Uh, that allows you to save a great deal of money. And uh, last but not least is we, we all recognize that we have uh, ICT strategies. And what we are advocating is that uh, organizations start considering how digital identities and credentials can be managed within your, your, uh, your IT, ICT strategies. So that will provide guidance and help you determine when you need to implement federated identity management. Um, so we, that concludes our session. We'd like to thank you for, for attending the session and uh, we'll now be open to questions. Thank you very much, Stan. You've simplified a, a very complex topic for our audience, and you've uh, also outlined a very compelling business case for its use when healthcare delivery organizations start uh, expanding their digital health footprint. So thank you again very much for that. I'd like to encourage folks to use the Q&A uh, window to enter their questions. And what I'll do now for the next 20 minutes or so is moderate those, uh, pose those questions to Stan, and we'll get his reply. So if you have follow-up questions, please type them in as well. Um, I won't identify you by name, but I can see who's uh, input the various questions. So we do have a few stands, so let me get started. Uh, what about the cost of retrofitting or replacing these legacy systems to work with uh, FIDM? Uh, good question. So, so we, we did mention the fact that you, know, you most likely would have to modify um, existing solutions. So if, if existing solutions have their own identity management components, their own authentication components, uh, we need to think about how we can modify those uh, to support an externalization, as I said before, of authentication and identity management features. Uh, we know of, you know, there are uh, products in the marketplace that are middleware products that help uh, ease the pain of modifying those applications. Uh, we're starting to see a trend with many uh, application providers where they're uh, supporting uh, some type of federated identity management capability. In other words, they're supporting uh, the capability to integrate to Active Directory services and other technologies um, to facilitate the externalization of uh, identity management and authentication, but it requires both. To be to be honest, uh, it's, you're, if you just externalize the identity management but not the authentication, that you know it gives you, it limits the the uh, the value proposition for you. So would you say there's still a uh, business kind of ROI with respect to retrofitting these systems, or does oh. it uh, adversely impact the value proposition? Oh, absolutely. Uh, we should consider what the, what the, the costs would be and the advantages. Um, the cost may initially seem high to modify an application to support um, externalization of identity management and authentication, but if it's the 12th application in a whole series of applications, we need to look at the bigger picture in terms of providing uh, usability for our end users. I mean, what is the impact of uh, an adoption barrier of having all of these identities for clinicians? What's the impact of uh, not of, of the loss of productivity. Because as, as people have these multiple digital identities and credentials, they keep forgetting their passwords and user IDs. They, they have a multitude of them. So, so they either obfuscate by choosing the same use, uh, password for all their IDs uh, or, or they're confounded with, you know, which one do I use? So there is, a, there is a productivity gain to be had by having one identity credential. That needs to be factored into the, uh, the ROI. Great, thank you. Um, maybe taking it from another perspective, new systems, uh, is there some language one could put in an RFP um, with respect to new systems to either say the solution needs to support an FIDM solution or even be FIDM ready? Uh, great question. I, I, I would strongly advocate for that being part of the criteria, pro the product selection criteria. So uh, things like do they support SAML v2, can that be implemented? Do they have uh, the interfaces necessary to configure the system to support both uh, in a federated identity management scheme or uh, the issuance of their own credentials? Because they may not just be a relying party, they may want to you can play multiple roles in, in a federated identity management scheme. You can be a credential issuer uh, as well as a relying party, depending on the context. So definitely, there is uh, there is some work to be done with regards to coming up with with that language, but uh, it's not overly difficult. 
Uh, we have a question here uh, around some of the technology protocols. Um, and this is in reference to federated SSO. Is SAML v2 the best protocol for federated SSO? Um, it's the one that's most commonly used. Is it the best? Uh, it really depends on the specifics of, of the, the situation. Uh, but we're seeing that this is more and more what I'll call the industry standard in this space. Um, there, there are other protocols like Open Off and, and others that are being used. Um, uh, just another interesting factoid, uh, the largest repository of digital identities is Facebook, and Facebook is also the largest uh, user of federated identity management. And the way they do this is through another protocol called OAuth, which essentially allows you to log in once to, to Facebook, and then they, they, they issue assertions to uh, all the other applications to ensure um, your authentication on your behalf, so you don't have to re-enter in your password. So there are other protocols, but um, some of them have strengths and weaknesses, and they, and they really need to be uh, evaluated with regards to how robust they are for the given usage. Another question that's come in is um, some some of these FIDM solutions sound like big infrastructure initiatives involving many stakeholders. Um, will these become big, onerous projects that take a long time to complete? Uh, what, what would you say to, to that point? Um, good question. We're, we're firm believers at InfoWay that, that um, any, any technology solution, and federated identity management is no different, can grow organically at a small local level. So if your problem is to solve access to many different applications within your healthcare organization, then you can begin with um, uh, implement the implementation of a federated identity management solution on a small scale within your organization. And as your needs uh, change, as you start interconnecting digital health solutions with other organizations that are housed by other uh, healthcare delivery organizations, you could probably roll out and expand your federated identity management solution to the other organizations. And then as this becomes, as the business needs progress, uh, you could do this at a regional level and then ultimately at a provincial level. But we believe that uh, these types of, of governance structures and solutions uh, have a place in terms of starting locally and growing organically. Um, I guess the, the big challenge when you're implementing something locally is uh, to make sure that uh, you position yourself so that you have uh, you minimize the amount of changes that would be required to your your trust models and your federated identity uh, management framework as you expand and include other organizations. So being aware of what any initiatives that are happening at the provincial level, at the regional health authority level, and trying to leverage those are really, really important. Uh, so so uh, plan ahead in terms of future expandability of any uh, federated identity management solution. Uh, we have a question here that's in reference to Ontario's One ID, but perhaps you could answer it uh, in that context and maybe generically uh, with respect to other solutions across the country. When you're looking at FIDM, um, does it have to be done and managed collaboratively with the registry, such as provider registry and client registry, or can it be deployed independent of those either of those registries? Um, both solutions are possible. It can be deployed independently, uh, where um, integration with a provider registry becomes interesting is um, if you're part of the um, identity proofing process, if you want to know whether before issuing a digital identity and a credential, if that person is actually licensed to practice in your province, you could actually um, consult the provider registry to obtain that information. Um, you may, as part of the uh, digital credential, want to include some type of information with regards to um, their professional practice rules, et cetera, that may be available uh, in a provider registry. Uh, we've, we've had some interesting discussions where you know, uh, regulatory bodies, provincial regulatory bodies, uh, uh, Royal College of Physicians have looked at, well, why don't we become the uh, digital identity and credential issuer for, uh, for clinicians? So, so there are many possibilities. And the same would hold true for, for, for consumers. Uh, you may want to consult the client registry, but it's not, um, it's not absolutely necessary. Great. Uh, another question is around uh, FIDM versus SSO. Um, we 
both know that both solutions help solve the irritant of multiple logins and multiple passwords and identities. But what is the trigger point for migrating, let's say, from an SSO environment to an FIDM environment? Mm. Um, good business question in the sense that uh, federated, uh, sorry, uh, single sign-on uh, solutions, the technology solutions, uh, have their place when we're trying to solve the irritant within an organization. Uh, unfortunately, most of the typical single sign-on technology solutions do not offer um, the federated identity management governance framework, the trust models that need to span across organizations. So when would we consider moving from single sign-on technology to a federated uh, identity management solution? Um, typically, it's when we need to cross organizational boundaries. So it's, it's rather difficult to implement this, this encrypted database of user IDs and passwords that spans organizations. can be done, uh, but uh, we're really not addressing the, the uh, trust models and the security models in that context. And so it may be a bit more uh, difficult to do that. But really, when we need to cross organizational boundaries is, is probably the, the best trigger. Okay, one more question here. I, again, I would encourage folks, if you have some additional questions or even follow-ups to one you posed before, uh, please enter those now. Um, one final question, unless we get some more, Stan, is what are the advantages and disadvantages of outsourcing FIDM solutions to a trusted third party? And maybe I could add, add to that, are there some trusted third party solutions uh, in Canada that uh, various stakeholders could leverage? Um, so. There are um, private sector organizations that offer uh, identity management solutions in the cloud. Uh, there's an organized Canadian organization called Security. Again, we're not we're not endorsing specific vendors, but um, several of the, the federated identity management initiatives we talked about earlier in the presentation use a technology from Security. Um, the advantages of that, well, uh, it's, it's really capital expenditures. You, you don't have to set up this federated identity management infrastructure, not just from a, a server's, uh, the, the server perspective and all the connectivity, but it's also from a hu human resources perspective. So you're really paying on a per transaction basis for, for the various needs um, associated with managing identities and performing authentication. So uh, if I don't have to spend the, the $500,000 to set up the servers and everything I need for uh, a federated identity management scheme, but I outsource that to someone who is a trusted third party that we feel comfortable with, uh, I can take that those monies and reallocate a portion of that to my operational expenditures, and the remainder of that I can put aside to do other things in the healthcare sector, at least with uh, digital health solutions, which would be advantageous. Where, where there are potential disadvantages, and I say potential disadvantages, are if you're doing business with a, uh, a third party, if you've outsourced uh, identity management and authentication, uh, the challenge then becomes, um, does their, do their uh, trust models, security models, privacy models meet your needs? So you need to assess those. You need to do the due diligence. And then the organization that, that you're, you're, you may be doing business with or wish to do business with has to have the flexibility in their implementation to meet any specific needs that you, you may have or you've identified. So um, th those are really the trade-offs. And we have one in here. It's got some acronyms that I'm not familiar with. Have you learned any lessons from JISC and in common frameworks? Uh, in, no, I'm not familiar with uh, the in common framework uh, or GISC. I apologize. Okay, yeah, I'm not either. Okay, well, I want to thank everyone for uh, joining us today. I uh, just want to remind folks that the papers are already posted on our website. You'll find executive summaries in French and English and the complete paper in English uh, at the uh, resource link you see on your screen. This presentation version of the paper as well as a recording of the webinar will be posted within the next few weeks, so I would encourage you to look for that as well. And in the meantime, if you have any questions for anyone in the Emerging Technology Group or Stan specifically, uh, feel free to email us uh, at the emails that are listed on this final screen as well. So once again, thank you very much and 